it's a quarterly event that we host. We've had three different editions, and this is the fourth edition. In this edition, we're going to be learning and discussing and exploring opportunities for creative businesses in the metaverse. So I want you to use the chat box to tell me what your name, where you're dialing from, and what you want to learn in this session. And I will just wait for more people to come and we'll probably just start in two minutes. But right now, share, tell us your name, tell us where you're dialing from, and tell us what you want to learn in this session. Fantastic. So I can see uh, Mike Strano uh, from Nairobi. Thank you so much for joining. He wants to learn about the future of video consumption. Thank you so much. Uh, so if you're on a call, please just uh, introduce yourself. Tell us your name, where you're dialing from, and what you want to learn in this session. Okay, so we have Tsunga Mira from Lusaka. Welcome. Thank you for dialing in. So let me just uh, give more people to join us. Let's wait for two more minutes and then we'll start officially. But use the chat box and um, <laughs> introduce yourself. Thank you. Okay, so I can see more people on the call. So please use the chat box to introduce yourself. Tell us your name, tell us where you're dialing from, tell us what you want to learn in this session. Okay, let the chat box buzz. Okay, so we're going to be streaming live. Um, once we have the link, uh, the live stream link, we're going to put it in the chat box. Okay, so just in case your internet uh, ships or is not uh, stable, you can always uh, fall back on our YouTube um, link. Okay, so um, I think we could just start. Yes, so I'm just going to start. Hello, everyone. Uh, yes, yeah, so the spotlight is Light is back on me. Okay. <clears throat> so like I said, my name is Toby Lola and I handle all things uh, community at the Creative Economy Practice at CCA Hub. And I'm going to be your moderator for today's session. Thank you so much for joining. Like I also said, the topic that we're going to be uh, discussing is exploring opportunities for creative businesses in the metaverse. <clears throat> so like I mentioned earlier, I said we're using the webinar platform and so you're not going to be able to turn on your camera or mute yourself but the only way you can talk to us is by using the chat box okay so move to the chat box and tell us your name tell us where you're dialing from tell us what you want to learn in this session now if you want to ask a question please use the question and answer button don't use the chat box you know to ask ask your questions please just use the question and answer button, because if you use the chat box, we'll be able to see your questions. Okay, so I also started by, you know, checking the chat box to see who's said something. Shem, Shomulu is saying he's joining, he or she is joining from Idaho, and he's an ardent fan of one of the speakers and hugely interested in matters related to the metaverse and related subjects. I'm interested in the metaverse, so I am super excited. Okay, so let's just move into it, you know, let's not waste any time, let's just move into it. So like I said, we're going to be streaming live 
and there's going to be a link placed in the uh, chat box. So let's see, let me introduce who we are to you, just in case you don't know who we are. I've introduced myself, my name is Toby Lola, but this is the Creative Economy Practice at CC Hub. And our main objective is to enhance job and wealth creation, and also opportunities for creative expression for Africans, particularly women and young people, through the African creative economy. Now we do this through investment, research, investment readiness, and community and ecosystem development. Now, this program, the seminar series, is underneath the community and ecosystem development. And we've, we've had uh, past editions. It's really a seminar styled event and it's curated for young professionals and entrepreneurs who are looking to improve their business skills, network, and collaborate with other creatives outside their immediate network and also access opportunities in the African creative industry. So previous editions that we held, the first one was on um, the trends and opportunities in the African creative economy. And there we had Bosu Tijani, the co-founder of Co-Creation Hub. We had Rimini Makama, who is the director at Microsoft. She's a director at Microsoft. And then we had our very own Ojama Ochai, the managing partner at the creative economy practice at CC Hub. The second edition had us exploring barriers and opportunities for trade and investment. And there we had Marie Laura Ngai. She's the founder of Restless Global. And we also had someone from Africa No Filter called Natasha Kimani. The very last edition was on monetizing intellectual property, and it was very interesting. We had the EVP of music at Chocolate Factory, I'm sorry, Chocolate City Music, that's Ivy Abidoye and she was a speaker. This is Creative Business Series 4.0 and joining us for the conversation on opportunities for creative businesses in the metaverse. We have Adeshola Fakile, we have Brian Afande, and then we have Sabiha Benugwa, and all of them are experts in their select fields. So right now I'm going to read their bios. And I want everybody on the call to give them a round of applause as I introduce it to each speaker. So I know you can't unmute yourself so that we can hear you clap, but use emojis in the chat box, uh, give them a resounding uh, applause because they're fantastic speakers. Our very first speaker is, is uh, I know someone is trying to clap. <laughs> okay, so read the first uh, speaker. So the first speaker is Sabiha Banuwa, and she's the founder of Jack Creative Studios. Sabiha is the founder of a successful design studio and has worked with over 30 startups to design and develop their tech products over the last eight years. She is focused on helping founders launch their startups quickly and efficiently. Beyond her work in tech, Sabiha is also passionate about mental health and the impact of technology on our well being and relationships. She holds a postgraduate degree focusing on anxiety in the digital space. And this has allowed her to gain a deep understanding of the ways in which our experiences of the digital world can affect our mental health. A round of applause for Sabiha. Let, let me see your emojis in the, uh, the comment section, the chat box. So I'm giving a round of applause for Sabiha. Sabiha, Hello. welcome to you are welcome to Creative Business Series 4.0. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. You're all welcome. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. Okay, so let's move to the second speaker. Uh, our second speaker is Ade Shola Fakile. Adi Shala Fakile is a maverick designer. He's a creative technologist, a solutions architect, and a digital author. He creates and prefers design and technology, technological solutions through critical need analysis. <clears throat> Excuse me. Which materializes cutting edge user-centric platforms and products for both consumers and businesses. With over two decades of experience in digital design and technology, <clears throat> excuse me, he's, he's here today and he's the founder of Megaheads, a creative technology company pushing the boundaries in augmented, augmented and virtual reality. 
His current research is in the use of a blend of artificial intelligence, emphasis on computer vision and natural language processing, augmented reality, virtual reality, to create experiential technology solutions that reimagine and connect to learning with fun and vice versa. Welcome, uh, Adeshola Fakile. A round of applause for him. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, toward speaker is Brian Afande. So Brian Afande is a co-founder and managing director of Black Rhino VR. He's also a board member of the Global Future Council. He's also a board member of the Global Future Council on the future of the metaverse at the World Economic Forum. As a creative technologist, <clears throat> Brian leverages XR knowledge to expand opportunities for significant economic growth among the youth that will help them develop new ideas, technical skill sets, new business models, and jobs that will contribute positively to overcoming our continent's development challenges. A round of applause for Brian. Welcome, Brian, and thank you for coming. <laughs> Okay, so you Thank have you heard. Me. I'm honored. <laughs> Thank you for being here, Brian. Okay, so you've heard the bios of all our three speakers, and we're just going to start the conversation. Okay, so this is how the conversation will go. I'm going to ask a question, and all our three uh, panelists will take turns in answering them. You all have three minutes, and uh, we have questions on the opportunities the problems, and the future of the metaverse. Now, after this conversation, which would last 45 minutes, we're going to move to the question and answer segment. And I'm going to read out the questions and the speakers can answer those questions. Afterwards, we're going to take announcements and we are going to end the session. Are we ready to dive into the metaverse? If you're ready, please just uh, raise your hand. I am super ready. And super excited. Yes, yes, yes. I feel the energy. So I have like five participants raising their hands. Thank you so much. So yes, we're diving in right now. So let me just give you a definition of the metaverse. It's not a new concept at all. It has always existed. Some people define the metaverse as an online space where people socialize, they work, and play with avatars. Now, the metaverse is steadily growing with top brands like Facebook heavily investing in building their platforms. And to show that uh, Facebook was serious, they literally changed their name to Meta and committed $10 billion to create uh, XR hardware, software, and content. So my very first question is to Brian. And so just like I said, just one question and I'm going to ask all the panelists. I'll be starting with Brian. Brian, you are a leading voice in the virtual reality and innovation space. Your brand, Black Rhino VR, has worked with a wide range of brands in sectors such as healthcare, filmmaking, to name a few. Can you share some of the opportunities that you believe innovation in the metaverse can bring for African creatives regarding job creation and wealth creation? Um, thank you so much for your question, Tabilola. Um, usually, I would, I would first just start by saying that a lot of the work that we do as Black Rhino and me as coming here right now, I stand on the shoulders of other individuals who are self-taught creative technologists. Um, I graduated from the prestigious school of YouTube Premium and the rest of my team has in the ecosystem. So um, my back, just a quick um, uh, background. I'm a marketer and a DJ. I found myself in the creative economy and I found passion in technology and I pursued that passion. So that's why I really loved Adesola with the guitar in the back because I feel you, my brother. Um, <laughs> a musical is in my DNA. I feel Some, you too, bro. <laughs> yeah, man, I, I feel that a lot. Um, some of the opportunities, Tabilola, I don't want to digress, but some of the opportunities that I've personally seen together with my team as well, let's look at um, job creation. I think what intrigues me about the metaverse is the fact that the metaverse allows us as humanity uh, the opportunity for us to look at linear information and present it in a spatial context. 
So when you look at linear information, the idea of 3D, I personally believe that the future is in 3D. And there's a lot of opportunities, not just for job creation, for people within uh, the gaming subsector, the gaming vertical. We're looking at people within um, not just the game design, where you have artists, animators, uh, musicians, writers, producers, and developers all working together in, in um, cohesive multidisciplinary uh, sort of teams to be able to create the metaverse. But we also have great opportunities for individuals who are in like spatial design and spatial audio. This is the future of audio is immersive. And there's opportunities I've seen for jobs whereby um, individuals who've been able to try to understand how you can be able to create specialized design and specialized audio. There's a lot of opportunities for jobs there. Other, another opportunity that I've clearly seen in the industry is when it comes to um, um, uh, uh, not just 3D creation, but when it comes to individuals who are deploying augmented reality, whether or not it's drag and drop sort of technology, or whether or not it's um, uh, whether or not it's off the shelf AR platforms, there's a lot of opportunities there. But also, I must say that these opportunities. There is one of the challenges we have is some of these opportunities, the way we look at it, we're supposed to change our mindset from being job seekers to job creators. And now I'll use this opportunity to talk about wealth creation. We're looking at um, an industry that is probably worth, by they say by around 2025, this industry is going to be well over, almost shy of a trillion dollars. Now, when you look at it, the compound annual growth rate of the metaverse, we're looking at, I'm talking about the whole spectrum of immersive technology XR. We're looking at a compound annual growth rate of around um, just shy of 50% year on year. So there is opportunities for us to tap into a global value chain where we can be able, not just as Africans to create our own solutions, because I personally believe that um, innovation in Africa is propelled by utilitarianism. And when you look at digital technology, I see there's opportunities for us as Africans to develop our own solutions for Africans, by Africans, and also export the solutions. So when we're talking about wealth creation, for me, it's very clear that there's a job creation part of it where people with specialized skill sets are going to be able to apply for jobs or also um, uh, land jobs in some of these companies that are already within the immersive space. But I see opportunities for young Africans to be able to venture into this and tap into this global um, uh, uh, value chain of XR. Thank you so much. Uh, that's that's insightful. Uh, Adeshola, do you have, um, can you share your insights to the question? Okay, um, great, great. Um, lovely stuff, Brian, lovely information. Um, you know, for me, the, the, the metaverse is the future that I, I saw as a teenager. You know, I, I was this weird kid amongst, amongst my peers, you know, and I, I often tell people that, uh, like, like Tobolola has rightly said, the metaverse is not a new concept. You know, my, my first experience of uh, what is metaverse like was uh, a platform called Second Life. I don't know, which was launched in 2003. My first experience of uh, of, of a platform that's related, like, uh, that has all the components of the metaverse was Second Life, you know? And I play around Second Life. Second Life had, uh, it was a place where you could, um, you could, uh, you, you'll have your own avatar created and you can move around different worlds, spaces, make friends, interact. They even had, they had their own legal system. They had the currency back then, you know? Um, so the metaverse is not new. And, and the truth is we are in good times. You know, uh, we're in special times, especially for creatives, because one, the entry level, the barrier for for getting into that space as a professional has been has been brought down drastically. You don't need to, back in the day when I started, you know, with software development in the early 2000s, you know, you needed to be a lot of things at once. You needed to be a programmer, a designer, a database engineer. You needed to wear you know, a lot of ads, but that's not the case now, we, you know, with the, with uh, low code and no code concepts being more mainstream. No code and low code is not new, you know, but it is now more prevalent, you know. So if you want to be a web designer, you want to be a 3D designer, you don't necessarily need to start 
from scratch in, in, in the way people did, you know, back in the day. You know, so there are opportunities for, for graphic designers who, who are uh, used to, who are confined within the space of print, you know, to upskill themselves. You know, it's easier for you if you're a graphic designer to become a web designer, to become a 3D designer, because you have like a, a foundation already, you know, in design. So it is very easy for you to adapt, you know. And, and one thing I'd like to highlight in terms of opportunity is now um, for us to really tap into the wealth creation spectrum, I believe that uh, a lot of content needs to be localized. A lot of solutions need to be localized to Africa. You know, uh, I'm talking about African solutions for Africans, where uh, the, 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 the solutions that we create is consumed by our own people. You know, before we think of exporting it to, uh, to other countries or other continents, you know, um, solutions that benefit us, that solves our problems. And now for us to achieve that, we need to be open-minded because you see, um, breakthroughs in any sector is often not pioneered by the experts within that sector. It is usually triggered by the people outside of that sector looking at, looking at us from the outside because if if I if I have a um, a design problem I'm trying to solve, you know because I'm technical, I'm I'm most likely want to solve that problem myself. What will exist uh, between someone like Sabia and, and myself will be collaborative effort, you know. Um, but what will exist between us and the end users, I mean, is problem solving. It's a, it's a scenario where we are analyzing their problems and solving it for them. You know, so we need to have uh, a scenario where we are collaborating with non-technical people, people from other walks of life, other sectors for the metaverse to become a more mainstream idea because we also need to understand that adoption is always lagging behind innovation. Do you understand? So, um, so the fact that the metaverse is now a thing that everybody is interested in does not mean that it's new. You know, the invention has always been there two, three decades. You know, so innovation, adoption is always lagging behind innovation. So for us to speed up the process, there has to be conscious effort to collaborate with people that are not within the space, bringing solutions to them, you know, illustrating to them how this can benefit them, benefit their businesses, benefit their way of living, you know, and, and make things, you know, uh, um, easier for them in terms of how they go about uh, their work life, you know, uh, situation. You know, and, and like, like uh, Brian rightly said, the future is 3D. You know, we're talking about immersive, uh, technology. The metaverse is taking immersion to the next level. You know, the, the gaming, the, the gaming uh, industry has always had that. I mean, in fact, with, with things like haptics, you know, uh, where you are in, in a VR space and you can actually, you know, get a feel of the virtual environment. You know, I'm, I'm talking about real, real sensation. You know, uh, you, you can pick up objects and feel the texture of the objects. You know, you have all of that now. So the metaverse um, is taking that to the next level uh, where the gap or the bridge between reality as we know it, you know, and reality within the metaverse is being blurred. So but back to opportunities that there are, there are opportunities, you know, for uh, creative professionals to upskill themselves and reposition themselves in a way yeah, that, that, that gives their work a greater meaning. You know, I'm talking about uh, the components market, for instance. Uh, a 3D designer can decide, you know, to embark on a project where it begins to create 3D assets that can be used across several channels. You know, and, and I'm not just talking for games alone. I'm talking for uh 
the engineering industries. You can decide that you want to create 3D models of cars, futuristic cars that um, automobile companies can, can buy and use, you know, in, in uh, um, designing their next fleet of, you know, uh, 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 automobile uh, products, you know, and, and the same thing applies for fields like fashion, for movies, um, if you are a 2D designer, you can create icons. I mean, so if you are audio, if you're a sound engineer or a sound designer, there's a space for you, you know? So uh, if you're a UX writer, there's a place for you because everything is driven on a narrative or some sort of story. Uh, so the opportunities are boundless, you know? Uh, we are only limited by our imagination. So the, the apart from the opportunities being available, we now need to think of, practical utilities, practical use cases, uh, put it in front of our minds that with every endeavor, you have to put uh, the user at, 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 the, at the center of it all, because it's all about benefiting the user and making life easier for the user. You know, this is very, very insightful. Thank you so much. I'll come back to some of the points that you made. Thank you so much at Ishola. Uh, Sabiha, please share your thoughts on the opportunities. Amazing. Um, I think I definitely agree what both the previous speakers had spoken about with regards to being a creative is actually the prime time for you to be using your skills to build and create the metaverse. And I think this is the opportunity to also upskill yourself as a creative because you are getting the opportunity now to design, to develop these virtual worlds and these virtual spaces in which will sort of bridge this gap between what we understand as the physical world and what we understand as the metaverse. And again, it's all such perception at the moment that you can make it up as you sort of go along and we're going to get to define what this is. I think with regards to wealth creation, I'd actually like to give some insight into something my team did in order to, you know, dwell in this metaverse economy a little bit. We actually launched an NFT collection last year with crypto.com and we leveraged artists, you know, in South Africa, in Nigeria, in Kenya, we worked with people and, and understanding how this cross collaboration in the metaverse can actually work because you're working with digital assets. So the distribution models are so much more seamless to be able to get product and services across the world. And we collaborated with a company in the US to actually sell the digital assets specifically to their um, community, essentially. And we had about 5,000 digital NFTs that were sold out in about 45 minutes. And <laughs> the best part of that is there was a royalty attached to every NFT. So every time it was resold, we got a percentage of those sales. We even told yesterday which is a year later it's coming in as cents but those cents add up and i say we've made at least a hundred thousand us dollars in royalties you know so i think understanding that being a creative again in whichever area right whether it's fashion music art we now have that opportunity to actually be compensated uh, for what we're doing and to have that ownership and understanding that with the technology that the metaverse allows like blockchain and tokenization and NFTs to be able to continuously be rewarded for the work that you are doing. And I think that to me is understanding wealth beyond just, you know, selling your time or selling your assets, but understanding what you're cre creating can actually evolve into passive income over time. So yeah, I think that's my little extra to what's already been said. Yes, fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Sabiha, for those insights. Okay, so I'm just going to move to case study. There are key points that I uh, heard from Brian, from Adeshola, and you, Sabiha. So I would ask after uh, the case study. So for um, the case study, uh, let me just bring up. Yeah, so within the African fa um, fashion sector, we have seen how fashion brands like Hanifa use virtual reality to showcase their collection. And um, most recently, South Africa, the South African um, retailer, retailer game used the uh, uh, partnered with Robolux to drive sales during their 
Black Friday. So they realized that there was a very strong gaming community in South Africa. So they decided to partner with um, Roblox to drive sales during uh, their Black Friday and Cyber Monday campaigns. Now the question is this, how have you seen ways that African brands in different sectors of a creative economy, how have you seen them innovate, you know, in the metaverse? So I'll start with you, uh, Sabiha, because you just mentioned something about selling NFT. So do you see any other, do you, is that something you've done? Or is there, is there, are there African brands that you've seen really do something fantastic? And like, this is, you know, this is super solid. Please share. Yeah. So, I mean, we have personally through my business um, done the NFT sales and we're actually launching another NFT based membership um, site in a couple of weeks, hopefully. But another brand that we actually collaborated with in South Africa is Fanfire, which is a Web3 development agency. And they were working with Strauss and Co., just like an auction house, essentially. And what they did was tokenize wine bottles specifically in from Cape Town where, you know, they create really amazing wine, not that I've tasted, but I've, I've heard. And the idea was to actually tokenize the wine bottles so that they could be sold as NFT tokens on the blockchain globally. So anyone from anywhere in the world could purchase this bottle of wine and have it be a investment, essentially, that they're making. So the wine never has to actually leave the seller, but as the wine ages, it increases in value. They're able to sell this NFT token and you know increase their wealth essentially without owning the digital i mean without owning the physical asset and that was also something that sold out and i think it was two million rand at the time which was also early last year when again i think nfts were, were booming a lot more than they probably are now whereas i think now the communities are asking for more around utility like um we were talking about earlier Another company in South Africa is called Moment. So they also started off as an NFT platform um, selling digital assets. And because of the energy crisis that we're facing in South Africa, they've actually created a product to purchase NFTs in terms of solar cells that are being placed on buildings. So you can invest in these solar cells and then get paid once electricity is generated and bought by the building that's using it. So you can essentially earn from the electricity that's being generated. So I think, again, it's trying to understand how these technologies can be used to solve the problems we are facing, well, in South Africa and in Africa in general, and then allowing people to invest in that and earn from that by helping each other, again, from the comfort of your home without any physical asset. You are now building your digital portfolio and understanding how you can essentially grow your wealth from the Fantastic insights. Uh, I really like uh, the solar cells. Very, very interesting idea. Thank you so much, Sabiha. So, uh, Brian, over to you. What are your thoughts? I think as a, as a DJ and a musician, one of the things I've seen that has created real value is um, live um, VR immersive sort of uh, experiences. There's a company in South Africa called Soda World, which is a platform that allows individuals, it's a collaborative entertainment platform that really allows individuals to come together, people in the real world and within the virtual spaces to do live concerts and stuff like that. I feel like because of um, COVID-19 accelerated a lot of use of immersive technology and the use of the metaverse. This is a really good example where you can have individuals, they could be in any part of the world, but then they have this platform that they can be able to collaborate and musicians can be able um, to perform live to an audience. Um, this for me is one of the things I feel like is a really good use case of um, a good brand that has utilized the um, a really cool use case of the metaverse. Another thing, of course, is uh, Rika, which is based in South Africa as well which is a platform that enables consumers to be able to superimpose uh, digital images of products into their environment. Um, I feel like this is also a really good opportunity, not just to use it as a visualization tool, but also to be able to create a differentiated consumer sort of experience journey. Um, when, you, when you look at how the, so we talk about the future consumer being able to access the digital 
and the physical world in one seamless experience called the digital experience. And brands like Rika have been able to allow individuals to superimpose these images in their comfort zone and make wise purchase decisions. And um, going forward, I feel like the power of the metaverse is going to be based on some of the interfaces that we use for the metaverse, whether or not it is a VR headset, whether or not it's a mobile phone or a laptop or whatever, it doesn't matter. The idea of the consumer being able to seamlessly, um, uh, seamlessly go through the physical and the digital world is a win for me. So these are two classic examples of some of the stuff that we've done, uh, some of the stuff that we've seen done in the market. But I also wanted to say, there's other individuals who are doing amazing work that are not brands. They are still working in silos. They're still developing a lot of compelling stuff as use cases within the creative economy. And I feel sometimes, you know, we look at these well-established brands that were able to get significant funding for their businesses. And we look at them as, you know, we can, other individuals can be able to pivot that. But on a grassroots level, there's a lot of individuals, like there's this dude that we work with. He's not part of my company, but he's running his own thing that created a virtual fashion brand that you can actually be able to walk in through a digital shopping mall. And there's different brands that are actually showcasing within that digital shopping mall. And this is just an individual who sat in a silo in his own room and developed this sort of experience. So I think with all fairness, sometimes as much as yes, brands are able to have time to build, you know, we're still looking at technology that is still early, it's nascent, possesses a lot of potential, but we should also look at what's happening on a grassroots level because I feel like this is also where the real change happens. Thank you so much, uh, Brian, for uh, that very insightful, uh, insight, your insightful uh, thoughts. Um, Ateshola, I'm curious to hear some of the brands that you have noticed that are innovating. Uh, okay, so so for me, there's, there's uh, quite a number of them here in Nigeria. There's a lot of gaming, small gaming companies, you know, that, that are focused on, on um, creating games, you know, um, uh, play to earn games and all, but two brands uh, that stand out for me. It, one is um, Afri Africa Rare, yeah, Africa Rare, uh, which is um, focused on real estates. So selling land, in in the metaverse i think i'm not sure i'm not sure it's a nigerian company i think it's a south african company actually africa rare because mt mtn bought a piece of land uh you know uh, yeah in in their in their metaverse you know but the one that that really jumps at me because I'm, I'm really particular about value creation and how how um we can really begin to shape uh, I'm very particular about creative technologists. I am. I have. I've been passionate about that space for all my life. You know. Um, so it, it is. It is. That's why this this particular brand I'm going to mention is very important to me. It's called Swift XR. Uh, yeah. Let me see if I got the name right. Yeah, Swift XR. So Swift XR. What they've done is to. They, it's not a metaverse thing they've created. However, what they've created is a software or a platform, a no-code platform that allows not just developers, but businesses and laymen, you know, to create virtual experiences. And they've taken it a, a, a step further to uh, include a bit of, not a bit of, a lot of flexibility within uh, what they've developed, which is the ability to integrate with already made platforms, other platforms like WordPress, Wix, uh, NVIDIA, you know, Shopify. So you can leverage their system to quickly create interactive experiences for the metaverse, you know? Uh, so back to what, what I said earlier about the bar being brought low to make the entry point easy for whoever it is, you know, that, that's interested in operating within that space as a professional. You know, so that that brand really, really, uh, they, they've done justice. Being an African company again, I mean, because for us, I mean, uh, coming from the late 90s and the early 2000s, I, these things were, 
ideas you borrowed from the Western culture. You know, so the fact that we're having an African company creating software, because when we talk about tech startups, you know, what you often hear is fintech, 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 fintech. Do you understand? And the question I ask is, why aren't we developing our own version of Fruity Loops? Why aren't we developing our own version of uh, Maya, our own version? And it's because we really do not have a lot of creative technologists. Yes, we have software engineers and software developers, but we don't have enough creative technologies. And this is the time for creative technologies to rise. Now I'm speaking like a politician. <laughs> so this is the time for creative tech. That's why I was excited when Brian mentioned, he used that term to be creative technology. He said, yes. Because folks think I'm worried for calling myself a creative technology. Someone said, ah, oh, that's just the post. I said, no, but creative technology is a thing. It, it, it has been for decades, you know, and, you know, and every creative technology is, is my family member. Like these guys are meeting us, Sabia and Brad, you know, uh, I'm their fan already. You know, so, so the fact that, because if, if we're going to pull in the grassroots, you know, uh, when I advise, young uh, aspiring technologists or developers, you know, I, I try as much as possible to dissuade them from following the path of their ego, which is, you know, the need that you need to go through this heavy pain or years of study before you become a professional. No. So there's a rule in, there's a tech, there's a principle in deploying tech, which is uh, dry kiss. Don't repeat yourself, keep it stu stupidly simple. You know, don't reinvent the wheel. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. If someone has built a platform that allows you to quickly express yourself, why not leverage that? Because you see, the future is to critical thinkers. You know, there's creating the, 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 the software or the solution or the experience, and there's the thought that goes behind it. The thought that goes behind it is the is the real thing. That's where the real work is. It's in critical thinking you know, that you are able to then determine what the best approach should be or how this is going to benefit because you have to be user-centric. If people are not buying into it, then it is not working. You know, then it is not solving any problem. You know, so XR, uh, Swift XR has, has really done that, you know, because then it will be easy for young people, aspiring technologists, aspiring designers, you know, it'll be easier for them to jump on the train, you know, on this metaverse train. Fantastic, fantastic. So I see that Brian needs, wants to say, he raises his hand up. So he essentially wants to say something. No, I was just saying, man, Adesola is preaching, like he's really <laughs> preaching. Um, honestly, I usually say that there's a, um, when you look at my, let's look at the history of where the technology has come from. We're smack in the middle of the fourth industrial revolution that will really fundamentally change the way we relate to each other, the way we live, the way we work. And our response as Africans, not our reaction, our response as Africans has to be integrated, has to be uh, inclusive, and has to be in such a way that we as young Africans, especially the young Africans, we have to chart our way, the beaten path that no one else has gone. The before, like you said, Adesola, when you look at creative technologies, I consider myself a huge creative technologist because out of interest, I've taught myself how to do something and I've convinced other crazy people to come and board to come on board and do the same stuff. And you have Sabiga here who's doing amazing stuff with the NFT space. And this is, this is a revolution in the making. And by all means, just to let you, um, just to also highlight something that I feel like first, there's a sort of, and I speak about this, there's a sort of colonial approach when it comes to digital technology, where the West will always uh, impose it to Africans like, hey guys, here's the internet. It's, it wasn't meant for you. You have it, do what you want to do with it. And the same thing that comes to XR, the VR headsets that have been created, the platforms that have been created are not meant for Africans. And when you see someone like Mohammed from Swift XR building a platform that is empowering the next generation of content creators, this is where we need to be going as a continent, where we are building for the local, you're building for African, by Africans. We are teaching ourselves, we are leveraging on our networks 
between each other. Today I pick up my phone, I know the Nigerians to call. Adesola is now one of the least. I call Judith Okonko. I call my guy uh, 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 from um, Kukunle. There's people that I can call and I know they are part of my network. And if I have a project, I don't want to depend on funding for the project. I know I'm running a company that has resources. And if I want to build a platform or work on something, I call someone from across a, uh, across the country and say, guys, can we work on this project together? Because it is actually based on mass adoption of the technology. So one of the things that I'm really passionate about is I personally see myself and my team as agents of change, accelerating the adoption of immersive technology in Africa. And I feel like this colonial approach to digital technology has to be something as Africans that we come and say, guys, no, there's a bad joke that goes around when they say that the only thing Africans know is consumption. Mm -hmm. we, we love to eat, we love to consume. No, Africans are also innately producers. So how do we use our ancestors have done a lot of the heavy lifting. It's in our blood. How do we use this? And how do we leverage on already existing technology to be able to pivot on it, to be able to start empowering the next generation of creative technologies? They're looking up to individuals like all of us having this conversation. When you look at this team, you know, sometimes I look at the attendees, there's 26 people right now having a conversation with us, 26 of the chosen few. And I feel like we, I don't subscribe to coincidence. Everything happens for a reason. And every day when I'm praying, I tell God, order my footsteps towards the destiny that you've chosen for me or the destiny that other people have chosen for, for, for themselves. Let me be a point of light in their life. And I'm telling you, as a person who's come from the streets, often as a very young boy at 16 years old, I'm running a business based on something that I taught myself. I've worked extensively in the continent. I've worked in Europe, in the States. I, ain't nothing I've never done. We are only three Africans in the World Economic Forum of the Future of the Metaverse. Three Africans. And I feel like young people need to start hearing these stories. The narratives, looking at what Swift XR are doing in Nigeria is amazing. They're building their own platforms. And I feel the narrative needs to go there. The narrative needs to be as Africans, we can be able to do this. But if we want to go far, we have to go together. Mm -hmm. So this is just wanted to say, Adesola, you're preaching, man, and amen, like I'm already alive. I want to come to Lagos or wherever you guys are. Lagos, <laughs> hey, um, we thank you so much for your time. Um, Adesha, like everyone is saying, is that you know Africans need to build uh, products that they can use and not necessarily, you know, uh, use uh, the technology that you know the Western world is passing to us. And I think this is something that uh, one of the speakers at the very first uh, CBS said. He was saying that you know blockchain in the West that they use it to create, you know. So they are looking, so it's created for problems that don't exist. So they are looking to solve, you know, the problems. But in Africa, you know, we're using blockchain to solve pressing needs. And he gave an example of um, uh, MFISA in uh, Kenya, you know, where you're using uh, SMS to send money, mobile money. And I think that this is very important. You know, I want to ask a question, but let me take it, let me, I am going to put it in, uh, the third uh, aspect of my question, uh, sorry, my problem question. So let's move to the problem. Numerous opportunities that exist in the metaverse. You know, we've been seeing uh, problems in intellectual property infringement, fraud, cybersecurity. And there's also this uh, narrative or what you know, we're experiencing as Africans, African creators. You know, we're living in a continent struggling with low economic growth, poverty among youth, I think inequality among women, and a lot of problems that, you know, a lot of people are thinking that this metaverse thing, you know, is it really solving Africa's pressing problems? And I know with what Adeshola and all of the uh, speakers have said, I see that, you know, it's, it can't solve pressing problems, but some people who don't really have a deep understanding of what the metaverse is, you know, some of them might just think, uh, this metaverse uh, conversation, are they really solving Africa's pressing problems? So the question is, do you think that the adoption of the metaverse can help solve 
pressing problems in the creative economy. And I know that you know you've answered some of it, but you know, let's just get right into it. Adoption of the metaverse, how can it solve pressing problems? You know, I know uh Sabi has said something about a light. Uh, Brian and Adeshola have also said things that you know other people are uh have uh, created, but just expand on this. I'll start with um Adeshola and then I'll move to Brian and Zubiha. Okay, uh thank you to brother. Okay, so so uh very 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 solid question. In in the light of of uh of of everything that is going on and, and the advancement and uh, and the whole scream about metaverse, uh, there, there's a framework that I came up with some years back. I call it the E3 construct. So using technology to drive education, entertainment, and engagement. So education, the idea behind education is that whatever you're trying to teach people, make it entertaining. Uh, and when you're entertaining people, make sure you're teaching them something in the process. Then engagement is where user experience design comes into play, which is redefining our, or making it easier or more interesting for people to want to engage your material. Now, um, at the base of mass adoption or solving problems is a lot of informal education. A lot of informal education is necessary to drive mass adoption of, of any, any technology or any solution. You know, so the truth is a, a lot more noise needs to be made, you know, and, and not just meaningless noise. I'm talking about consciously making efforts to guide people and educate people on the importance, the significance, and the help, you know, that the metaverse can, can, can bring into their lives and their businesses, you know, because um, what you don't show people, they, they don't know, you know, and the fact that they are express, expressing doubt is proof that there's some sort of curiosity there to tap into. Now, in Africa, for some people, they, they, they don't even really know how to use the internet yet. And we want to dump the idea of the metaverse or the blockchain on them. You know, so I, I it, it, it will feel it will feel like uh, rocket science. You know, so a, a lot of relearning and um, um, pushing aside um, old ways of thinking, which we boils down back to open mindedness again. But you see, it's our responsibility as the professionals and the experts to make to create forums to begin to create forums consciously that would educate people not on the advanced stuff on the basics. Because you see, if the if, if the foundation is faulty, there's nothing you can do. You can't build, you can't build anything on no foundation. So for instance, if you are going to leverage, you can't leverage the metaverse if you don't know what a wallet is. You can't leverage the metaverse if you don't know how to create a wallet, you don't know what the passphrase is, you don't know what the decentralized exchange is or a centralized exchange is. If you don't know all of those basic things, the metaverse will seem like a far reach for you. Uh, mm -hmm. You understand? So at the base of all we're talking about, a lot of uh, informal education, a lot of informal education needs to come into play where we are organizing practical workshops for end users, not just workshops for people who want to be content creators or 3D designers or blockchain experts, but I'm talking about practical workshops, exhibitions that are you know, geared towards inspiring people on the significance, the importance of the metaverse and how it can help us showcase ourselves, showcase our, our uniqueness as Africans, not just you know, to our people, but to the outside world, we get to a point where we can begin to export our skill set in real time, our solutions in real time, and get the, the rest of the world to buy into what we have to offer. Uh, you know, so I think at the base of it is education, education, education. What people don't know, they don't know. You know, so, you know, I engage clients, people you think will know stuff, they don't know it and it's not their fault. They simply don't know. And we need to realize, Sabia, Brian, we need to realize how privileged we are. Mm. You know, to, to have started when we started, 
you know, and to have, because I have friends who are, who are brilliant creative technology, but they fell by the wayside. I mean, they, they, they not call themselves bankers or project managers. I mean, I, I won't call them sellouts. It, it can be pretty tough to, you know, to, to, to own your difference, you know, and, and, and stick to your path, even when people think you're crazy, you know, <laughs> so education, I'll say is, is critical. Because again, I, I I'll I'll reemphasize this. The explosion, the explosion will happen, whether we like it or not. I mean, it's here. We're in the 6K K wave. Do you understand? Uh, so we're in the era of cloud computing, spatial computing, uh, reusable energy, IoT, and the rest of it. You know, so uh the seventh wave might be where the metaverse you know, fully takes form and shape. And it will it, it, be nice to ensure that in our own little way, as agents of change, we are preparing the minds of the people because technology can be intimidating, you know. So, it, I mean, it's the reason why practical transfer of knowledge, you know, to end users is very critical and important. You know, so I'll say informal education, 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 trainings, subsidized trainings, free trainings, free workshops, week in, week out, month in, month out, YouTube channels, uh, white papers, things that people can consume, you know, in, in simple ways to, to give them a better understanding, you know, of the space and, and the opportunities that it offers. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Adishala. Brian, over to you. Um, first, yes. I feel like the seismic shift will come from the educational sector. And as much as the informal way of learning is important, I feel like also the formal way of learning is as important. I think there should be some form of educational reforms because I personally feel that the skills, like I mentioned before, the skills acquired in institutions of higher learning are not the skills that are required in the market right now. There's a huge disparity of that. And this has to be addressed from a point of reformation within the educational sector. But another thing that I feel like we should also look at is accessibility. First, accessibility of not just the hardware. I feel like, like I mentioned before, as Africans, when we're looking at on a technical standpoint, when you're looking at a 360 film or a VR experience or whatever, your phone has the right sensors for you to be able to go what you call a 3 of experience. You have an accelerometer, you have a good gyroscope, you have a HD screen. Anyone can put a phone on a Google Cardboard and go through an immersive experience. The form factor might be different, but we can. We are yet to see Africans coming and it's not really on our shoulders as as let's say for instance, Black Rhino, but even every other individual that is listening here, there is no single VR headset that have, has been developed for Africans by Africans. And our phones, we've innovated around the mobile phone. We've really shown the world that we can innovate around the mobile phone. It's so unfortunate that a company like Meta, formerly Oculus, discontinued the Oculus, um, Oculus Gear VR, which was leveraging VR on a mobile phone. And Africans are still waiting for them to create. No, this is an opportunity for us to create. Another thing is to decolonize our minds. We need to unlearn a lot of stuff. Like the way the, way the, educational, the, the educational system has been structured, there's certain things that we believe are not for Africans. There's certain things we believe that it's not our role as Africans to do. But why can't we sit down and interrogate the norm? and say, this is the reality of what's happening in Africa. We need to decolonize our minds and unlearn the fact that, that it's a matter of evolution. Web3 Web, Web is already here with us. We're looking at, like you said, uh, uh, the solar. We're looking at spatial computing. You're looking at um, uh, uh, IoT. These are things that can accelerate. Already the technologies are accelerating a lot of um, uh, verticals within the society. And as Africans, we need to first change our mindset. Technology anxiety is a huge thing, but I don't blame us as Africans, it's foreign. When you see me wearing a big VR headset and I go to the village for crying out loud, my grandmother thinks it's voodoo. It's yeah. a white man's voodoo. I'm like, yo, wait, this is technology. This is where it's coming from. This is where it's going. And we need to look at the value of 
how can we how are we able to look at technology anxiety because people fear what they don't understand mm -hmm. now how do we create that emotional bridge between this is the hard part of the technology itself but how do we start trusting it then we start talking about privacy i don't trust it because my information is being stored somewhere that i don't know of then you have now looking at when we're building the metaverse you have what you call the metaverse standards forum what are these interoperable what are these interoperable frameworks that allow us to build a more inclusive um, metaverse that is um, um, that is catering for some of these needs that we have as africans so i feel like also we need to be start working together addressing some of these problems together because for real as an individual, I've seen technology anxiety in institutions as a matter of institutional culture. People who have the right funding, local companies that have the right funding, they have the right networks. But because of technology anxiety, it's affected the adoption curve. And they sit down and say, no, this thing is not for us. It's highly foreign. It, it won't relate to our target audience. But you're like, guys, what are you talking about? First, it's a matter of evolution. So anyway, this is what I think. My bad. I think I went into a rabbit hole. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Brian. Uh, Sabiha, please share your thoughts. I want to just say the passion is very palpable in this audience today. Thank you guys so much. I think when I think of some of the problems uh, beyond you know, education and adoption that the metaverse or the virtual worlds can at least open up opportunities for. And I think in the creator economy, something we struggle with a lot is, you know, revenue streams and understanding equitable compensation. And I think that's one way that the opportunities are going to be there, whether it's just going to solve it by nature, I don't think so. I think being able to go into a new space and into a digital world and not take your societal, cultural issues that are currently prevalent is going to be the tricky thing. So for example, if you take, you know, compensation of female technologists, right? Like there's not a lot of us to start with or not a lot that are in the media and are earning at that rate. And I think there's something about the metaverse's anonymity that will allow for that if we again trust in that space. So if you take like the blockchain, for example, your identification is not around your gender. It's around, you know, a wallet like Adi Shola spoke about, understanding how the technology is created to almost be trusted, but be anonymous at the same time. Because it exists on the blockchain, you can trust this thing, you can track the information, you can track your contracts, your compensation, but that is not necessarily linked to identity the same way it is in Web2, for example, where it's linked to you know, your email address, it's linked to a photo of you. The way we understand how to trust a digital entity right now, I think that's going to change a lot. And in that space is what's going to open up possibility for us to challenge the problems we are facing as creators right now around, you know, what can you trust, privacy, copyright issues, um, collaboration and global reach. I mean, those are a lot of the things we're struggling with right now. And I think once we get the education once we understand what it's capable of and then choose to consciously make different decisions, choose to not bring what we understand right now and what we are safe and comfortable with right now into a different space that has the opportunity to break those norms. Because I think that's where that anxiety, the um, those feelings really come from. It's, I don't understand, this feels foreign, this doesn't feel real, this money doesn't feel real. How am I, you know, transacting on a cryptocurrency? But at the same time, if you realize that all of this data and all of this information is fully transparent, you can actually start to trust the process. You can start to trust that this is a, possibly a new way of working with each other, a new way of interacting with the world, and a new chance to change some of the social constructs that I think lead to a lot of the problems we have in the creator economy right now. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Sabiha. Brian, please share your thoughts. Yeah, I just wanted to add on what Sabiha was saying, which is really, really super important. Um, 
So as Africans as individuals who have um, historically been marginalized, Mm. And when you look at this, whether or not they are part of the digital divide that exists, but there's individuals who've also been historically marginalized, and I'm personally passionate about this, is individuals who are um, not neurotypical. Individuals who, when they go to a classroom, they are told they're actually stupid. And these individuals are not stupid. They are neuropathways. They, they, they flare differently than uh, uh, neurodivergent. And I feel like the metaverse allows us, if we talk about the metaverse being a socially inclusive digital society, mm -hmm. all voices matter, all genders matter. I feel it's important as, as Africans to find out how we can be able to reimagine what the metaverse means to us as Africans and not follow the pathways that have already been created by individuals from the global north. I feel like we need to start thinking about how we can make it more inclusive for Africans to be able to have their voices part of this, um, uh, uh, their voices part of this uh, whole uh, revolution. It's important because it's a small project that we did. We used something as simple as 360 filming to get individuals who are part of the, um, of the spectrum, right? In class, you know, when, when they're part of the spectrum, by the time they go out, their transition into class is a huge challenge. They can't focus. So we used scenic experiences where the teachers put the VR headsets and these kids all of a sudden were in fantastic images and, you know, really good sound. By the time they transitioned into class, they're not weird anymore. They're not stupid anymore. They are part of the, they are part of the community. So I feel like Africans, there's something that we have to learn from these people who've been historically marginalized that we can be able to re reinvent those certain pathways, how can we add more value to these individuals? So Sabiha, you just got me thinking and I didn't want to lose that train of thought. That's why I raised my hand up. Yeah, and maybe just to, to go on that is we can't create the metaverse in isolation again, right? Like those are the mistakes we've made as technologists in the past is yes. to yes. And come up with our own solutions, create things to problems you don't properly understand. And I think bringing the public in, and that's where, again, Adishola's advocacy for education with the public is so important because we all need to come together to understand our problems, to acknowledge them, and then to build solutions together. Otherwise, you're building technology that is so far removed from the people and the communities and the societies that you want to use it. It's just going to sit on the shelf again, right? The metaverse is going to be something that's away from you. You're not going to feel connected to it. And I think, you know, getting that education is so similar to where we are in this process is almost like trying to explain what a mobile app, you know, in custom software was to the, to the everyday person 20, 30 years ago. They're like, they couldn't imagine what this could have been and how permeable it can be in your life and how you don't need to know what technology it's built on. You don't need to know it's an NFT or blockchain, but you know that it's solving a problem for you. You're getting your groceries delivered to your house or you're getting money sent into your account. And I think once we start taking it to everyday problems that we are facing, it's going to be easier, easily adoptable. Instead of thinking of it as, you know, this player one world that exists only for a specific group of, you know, really techie people. I think it is going to be quite a challenge, but it's also the joy of us that are part of building this is keeping in touch with those communities. Thank you so much, uh, Sabiha. Thank you, uh, Adeshala and Brian, for your fantastic insights. So I'll ask, I have two or three more questions, but I really want to ask this particular question on the problems that uh, innovators have. So, you know, innovating in the metaverse is actually quite expensive. Just like you said, the VR headsets, some of them are really expensive. And then you also get to have uh, mobile data in different African countries being slow and expensive. So the question is, how can creative businesses, individuals, you know, who want to use leverage XR, VR to create innovative products for Africans, individuals, how can they navigate this funding challenges? I know you said a lot about collaboration, but how generally can they start? So I will start with Sabiha, I'll move to Adeshola, and then Brian will be last. Yeah, I think 
like we were saying before, we're talking about the metaverse, but some people have not even experienced a phone or the internet right now, you know. So I think there's so many different challenges and you can't really tackle them all at once. So you kind of have to acknowledge where you are, acknowledge the facts of what the reality is and then see what the next possible step is. And I think a lot of that, at least for me, is you know working with the private sector and working with startups and companies that have already gotten funding from wherever. We're not going to delve into that, but actually collaborating, and that's where, when I say collaboration and understanding that you can now, that collaboration across the continent is so much easier. Like me sitting in South Africa, I can collaborate with a funded startup in Nigeria or, you know, in in the US even. Like sometimes they're the ones that are, you know, sitting with the funding, but they're trying to solve African problems. There's, I've met so many startup founders outside of Africa, outside of the technology space. Like Adishola said, they're looking in, right? And they are trying to see how can they, actually leverage what we have to solve problems. And I think it's connecting with those and building those networks and accessing funding that's already there to be able to bring your ideas and to actually execute on on your skill sets. I think another thing that I've really seen is growing is the crowdfunding and community-based funding for these sorts of projects. And I know the NFT space has been used for that where, you know, collections are being sold with roadmaps to say, listen, we're raising funds, like you're getting access to this roadmap, you're becoming a member of this project of this problem that needs to be solved. And it's almost like initial investment. And then along the way, this is what we're planning to do with that money. And this is how you are actually going to earn back from that. So as said, including the people that you're actually trying to solve the problems for, if you can get them on board early on and self-fund and, and crowdfund, you actually can hopefully build better products together, hopefully in collaboration with private with the private sector. Okay, so so uh, good stuff, Sabia. You know, I, I also feel in addition to what she has said, you know, I feel that um, for, for one to successfully, uh, or to, for one to be successful at business, one, one requires business mindedness. Mm -hmm. I, here's what I mean by that. You know, as creatives, there's a tendency to just dwell on the product and neglect the other variables that's responsible for scaling the product and ensuring that the product gets in the hands of the right set of people and solve their problem. Now that's a different ballgame entirely. You know, creating the product is hard work enough so I can understand why, you know, uh, after creating the product, the creative just wants to relax, you know? So, and, and that's why collaboration is very essential. You know, to, to make the metaverse a reality in Africa, a practical reality, we need to build a strong ecosystem, a strong value chain of different kinds of professionals. With the technology alone, you need people who pr produce, uh, who will have to create uh, adware products like like uh, the the VR headsets. You know, um, I, I you don't we don't need. You can actually right now um, get a very cheap. Headset. I mean, you, you don't need the Oculus Quest or the HTC Vive or the HoloLens. You know, with your mobile phone, like Brian mentioned, with your mobile phone, you can just get a, a VR box, you know, put in your phone and you have an immersive experience. You know, but like also, like you mentioned, we do not have any headset that has been developed by Africans for, by an African for Africans. You know, so... Uh, the public sector needs to come in, private sector needs to come in. We need the base infrastructure. We need to start considering having our own base infrastructure. By that, I mean data centers, because the metaverse requires a very, very, very uh, huge computing power to process. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? So we are talking cloud technology. We need cloud architects. We need cloud engineers. You know, we need... Uh, uh, finance people to come in to help us map out practical, realistic financial projections on how this can benefit the continent, benefit the sector, benefit people, create job opportunities, create wealth, you know, and whatnot. 
We need PR. <laughs> we need PR. We need journalists. We need we need storytellers to capture this story and disseminate it so that people are aware. You know, we need the buying of the government. I'll tell you what India did. India, you know, when you talk about technological advancement, you can't escape mentioning Indians. But you see, it's not magic. It's a conscious effort. Mm -hmm. That effort started in 1958, where they injected science into their policy. Then from science, they, they, they injected science, I think science and technology. Then in 2013, it was science, technology, and innovation. You know what they did? They localized that sector where software developers could create solutions and make money from their solutions by selling it to Indians, not exporting it to America, not trying to get some funding from, from, from Silicon Valley. You know, they kept it within themselves and they serviced themselves successfully. Small businesses could afford to buy, you know, technology and use technology to drive their business. That is what we need to get to, where the woman who sells Amala and Ewedu Mamaput can leverage an African tech solution. The retailer, you know, across the street can leverage technology and use it to drive his business, you know, and, and he's not paying some software developer or some software provider, you know, outside the continent or outside the country. That's where we need to get to. But for us to get there, we need the base infrastructure that would allow us. I mean, and, and there's no there's no arm in collaborating with with tech giants from the Western world. We can have uh, profitable agreements with the likes of Amazon to create data centers, you know, across the continent. So that I mean, we, we are not we are not uh, picking a look when we are deploying uh, or architecting our, our environment for for the metaverse. We are not having to point to a location in London or America. You understand? You can I can point I can be in Lagos and point to a data center in Abuja, you know, or point to a data center in Ghana. You know, so that's where we need to get to. But to get there, we need to um, come out of our silos, you know, as, as creatives. You know, creatives were like this demigods. We just, we're like monks. <laughs> we have a tendency to be that way, you know. But, but, but we need the help of other experts. We need sociologists. We need psychologists. We need marketers. We need... Uh, finance people. We need the insurance experts. It doesn't sound like, you know, there's a need for them, but there's a need for all of these guys. We need the buying of the government. You know, we need representatives in the government, you know, that will inspire policies that will, you know, make this change a reality so that it's not just some something we imagine in our heads, you know. Uh, so so that, that, that's what I think. Uh, we need a strong ecosystem and we need to build that ecosystem across the continent. I'm not just talking Lagos, Nigeria, across the entire continent. And we need to, and the time is now to start building it. Fantastic. Brian? I love it. Um, listen, I just want to say the chat is fire. I'm really enjoying <laughs> reading the chat. Like it's... <laughs> Yo, soon, man. You're killing me. Thank you so much. Like the chat is really fire. Um, maybe let me not not play devil's advocate, but maybe let me throw a spanner in the works, right? For there to be significant, guys, we are all Africans. I hope we're all Africans here. We share the same problems, guys. And one of the biggest challenges we have is governance. Our governments, the politicians, you know. A lot of economies in Africa are, are, politi are political economies. So the politics of governance is really ruining Africa. But I also want to say for there to be significant growth, the government has to be part of that in one way, shape or form. And me of all people have always believed in building and then the government will come later. And that's what happened. We built for many years and the government came later, but for there to be significant growth, there is, institutions and, and networks that the government has that can be able to facilitate and fast track this growth. For instance, bilateral and multilateral agreements between, uh, between African nations and the West. We're looking at 
coming up with frameworks that would allow people to partner. For instance, in Kenya, we have something called the American Growth Opportunity Act, right? It's about the Americans and Kenyans to work within a certain framework, right? But what if government could actually come and say the future of skill sets is changing? The, the digital economy is here right now. And there's an internet economy and young Africans need to play a part into that economy. Let's look at the statistics. They say by 2025, I stand corrected, half of the world's youth population between the age of 18 and 25 years old is going to be in Africa. This is either going to be a delight to see or it's going to be a disaster. So it's incumbent on us to try to also sit down and look at a policy level. How do we create the right policy? And for me, policy is about me getting out of my comfort zone and sitting with boring bureaucrats and trying to find out how we can be able to create multilateral, bilateral agreements. The West see the value. The West see that value. And the Global North want to work with this workforce that is coming out. But you have, let's say, a country like Kenya that has been termed by World Bank as debt risk. So even the institution that can be able to provide funding directly to the government are not going to give funding to these people because already all the financial instruments that exist within that sort of framework is untrustworthy. They can't give them any more funds. So they're looking at the private sector. And the only way I can personally sit on the table as, a, as a, someone from the private sector is if I get into more or less the political um, uh, nuances of how I can be able to work with government so that I can be able to tap into the individuals who can be able to fund some of these projects and the individuals. So the, I, the, the real reality is that as much as I hate government, they are in a position to actually create the right bridges for us to walk through with the whole generation behind us and chatting forward and saying, this is where we are going. The government has failed us. They're, they're, they're going to be laggards when it comes to adoption. But we are the voices of the voiceless. We should be able to sit down with them. I hate wearing suits, man. I will wear a suit and I will walk into a boardroom if that is what takes me to be able to uplift a whole generation. Another thing that I feel we should be also able to, to highlight is the fact that when, when you look at the funding opportunities that exist, our problem and our challenge is not really funding. Today, the fortune for me is not in the, the fortune for me is not in being funded a million dollars, being given $2 million. No, the fortune is in the journey. So if you give me a million dollars and I don't know how to, and I don't know how to be able to uh, commit, to be able to create certain frameworks that can be able to create um, a transparent way on how I can be able to handle that fund, then I lose that, that money. The thing we need to do is to educate the people within the culture and creative industries to understand what value chains are. There's a whole value architecture that exists. For me as a creative technologist, I know I cannot work alone. I need to work with a team. I'm not an accountant. I'm not a financial manager. I'm not a market intelligence. I don't do business development. But we need to understand that within the culture and creative industry, we need to start working. It's a highly, let's call a spade a spade. The CCI is a highly defragmented industry. And also the CCI is not data driven. There's a reason why seven out of the 10 unicorns we have in Africa are in the FinTech. Why do you think they're in the FinTech? Because FinTech is part of the oldest, uh, the oldest verticals and it's banking. They've been collecting data for years. Why don't we start also having data-driven, um, a, a data-driven CCI based on the fact that we understand what a value chain is? And in this value chain, what is my significant role in this value chain? Then we come together as a block and we say, guys, we've already established businesses based within the CCI. Let's start now pushing for, uh, let's start pushing for funding because we are moving together as a block. Now, another last thing is when you look at the CCI, how many people do you think are from the culture and creative economies and are actually in public service? We are too comfortable here. Do you expect a bureaucrat to come in today and make decisions for a creative and they've never understood what a creative's needs are? I think this is also where the huge challenge is. We are so comfortable being in our own silos and bubbles. We don't want to run for office. 
oh man, me give me the budget, me I'm going to run for office. And I'm going to make sure that I'm a cancer from within the parliament. And I say that I want to make sure, the young people want to make sure that when it comes to public participation, when it comes to being able to ensure that the, we are custodians of the future, these bureaucrats only care about their fancy cars, their big houses, they don't care about us. So the people, a lot of individuals within the culture and creative industry, we need to also step up, run for office, make sure that these policies that we want to be implemented are actually things that we see that will bring value to us as a creative economy and not the bureaucrats. The bureaucrats don't have our interests at heart. Very, very, very intenseful, in intensive, you know, but very inspiring conversation. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to go to the last question. And I want all our speakers to use 40 seconds because we're literally out of time. Someone in the comment section, Shil Shomulu said, oh my God, the speakers are burning me up with inspiration and paradigm shift some assault. <laughs> you guys are doing good. Thank you so much. Keep your comments coming, you know, in the chat box. So one more, a very last question, and it is on the future of the metaverse. So I want you to use 30 seconds, 30 seconds, please. <laughs> so just share your thoughts. What are your thoughts about the future of the metaverse? I'll go with Sabiha, Adeshola, and Andrew Brian. Okay, let's go for it. So in 30 seconds, I think if today was anything, uh, any indicator, I think we have the right people in the room at least to at least start collaborating to make the metaverse what we need and what we want it to be. And I think it's about getting more people on board on this mission and to drive the education and entrepreneurship and innovation around actually making this a reality for us. And I think it's very, very possible to build the worlds we need with the people we have today. Fantastic. Next, Adishala. Okay, so um, one, one, one thing I would like everyone to, to take away from this is the fact that, you know, uh, the worldwide metaverse market, you know, is estimated to reach around uh, 1.3 trillion by 2030. You know, that's provided that, I mean, the, the, the investment that goes into the sector um, stays the same every year, you know, but whether or not it reaches 1.3 trillion, I can say for a fact that the metaverse is here to stay and the opportunities are bound immensely. You know, uh, I'll leave with this statement. Um, the harvest is plenty and we need uh, to gather the reapers. We need more reapers. We need to gather the reapers. The harvest is plenty and we need to position the reapers for the harvest. Fantastic. Thank you, Adishala. Brian. Amen. They say the harvest is plenty, but the laborers are few. Well done, my friend. Um, I really believe in working together as a block. I feel like the future of the metaverse will depend on one thing. And this is our social sort of capital within this particular um, um, uh, uh, creative industry. I feel like the experimentation, the failing, let my test be the testimony. Let my mess be the message to the rest of the people that the some of us that are privileged to have the opportunities to walk in doors that no other Africans have walked in. Right? And if we walk through those doors, believe it or not, with my ancestors as my witness and with God as my witness, we are building bridges for a whole generation. And it's important for us to understand we need to start working as a block together. I'm always in um, South Africa, Sabiha, I'm going to hit you up. I was in Lagos. The last time I was in Lagos, I had a really good time. Yo, guys, for Lagos, I think the energy was, it was too addictive. I always tell my pals, you guys have to go to Lagos to understand to understand where that real Africanism comes from, that energy. And th this is it, we need to start collaborating, start putting our resources together. We need to demonstrate with all fairness, we need to demonstrate the socioeconomic significance of these um, technologies for there to be real change. We need to demonstrate that socioeconomic um, aspect of it and a dimension. 
And I feel like the only way we can demonstrate that is if we start working together as a block. This is not time to compete. This is time to build for a generation. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, we've run out of time, so I just would like to take a couple of questions. But I just want to say thank you so much, uh, Sabiha, Adesh Ola, and Brian for, you know, sharing with us this insightful, you know, your insights on, on this uh, topic of opportunities for creative businesses in the metaverse. You know, honestly, I literally am going to rewatch this video on, on YouTube because we're live streaming and, you know, once the live stream is over, the video will be available for everyone to watch because they're very deep, you know, key conversations that you talked about, education, collaboration, you know, Africans actually, you know, overcoming, you know, the fair technology, you know, uh, Brian, what did you call it? So the word that you called it? Uh, well, technology anxiety. Technology anxiety, yes. And I truly believe in that a lot of people are scared, you know, of how to use technology and the, the things that they can expect from that. So um, we're going to take 10 more minutes of your time to just go through some questions that just five and I believe that we can answer it. So this is what I would do. Um, we're going to take less than hopefully hopefully one question, one minute. Uh, Tsungambi Ra is asking, is there a catalog? So this, um, I would like Sabiha to answer this particular question. Is there a catalog of African metaverse experts we can work with? Similar to what I would find on Fiverr, but for Africans working on African content and understand who understand our culture. So uh, Sabiha, please quickly uh, answer this question. Thank you so much. Um, not that I know of, which is probably maybe the first thing we can all do is start putting that catalog together. And maybe you guys can initiate that and we can all start adding who we know. And you can be the yeah. central point for this Definitely. and if somebody else knows. Sure. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Sabiha. Uh, Atisha, last, uh, so this question is to you because you mentioned uh, creative technologists. So Ade Laja Uluwafem is asking, uh, can you kindly share more light on how we can get more information? What is a uh, creative technologist? Uh, so just briefly. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, okay. Um, it, it's something, maybe, maybe it's an information I can put together and send to you to Blola, but um, for the sake of, uh, because of time, I'll just touch on it a bit. So it's creative technology is a, is a multidisciplinary field of study that, you know, blends um, uh, the creative aspect of technology with the technical aspect of technology. So basically art, science, technology, and everything in between merged to, together to create unique, unique experiences. Uh, so a creative technologist is very heavy on the creative side of things, uh, in addition to having technical knowledge of how um, technology works. You know, so but I, I can I can send in um, uh, an extra material on that yeah, for your consumption. I hope that's fine. Thank you. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, one more question, Tong Tungamira uh, is asking, and I think I'll allow uh, Brian answer this question. It's a bit longer. I'll read it out, and you know, hopefully, you get what he's trying to he or she is trying to ask. So the person is saying we are we are witnessing a surge in the provision of metaverse and extended reality development training, such as those offered by institutions like uh, Secute Stream, uh, at a very uh, at a considerable cost of around four thousand. Now, in light of the need for democrat democratization of knowledge and ac accessibility, can you? suggest strategies or innovative models that can be implemented in our countries to make this uh, crucial learning resources more financially viable and available, you know, because I think that that's something that you had mentioned, you know, education, a lot of people want to know they have these skills, but it's not, you know, strong enough and they want to learn more. But what he's saying is that there are a lot of institutions that charge very high and this particular one, circuit stream, it's four thousand dollars, and not a lot of people have four thousand dollars. So, can you share um, innovative models or strategies that can be implemented in our countries to make these crucial learning resources more financially viable or even freely available? Yeah. 
Um, yeah, of course, th this is a significant challenge within the continent. Um, one of the things I feel like has happened is the internet has really democratized access to information across the globe. There's online platforms, honestly, that on Coursera, there's online platforms that you can be able to learn how to do this stuff and doesn't cost an arm, as, uh, an arm and a leg as opposed to other institutions. So first thing I would advise you to go to Coursera, look for there's some really good AR, VR courses there. They don't cost an arm and a leg. I believe there's, there's a program that we do that we are constantly training filmmakers. We developed our own curriculum, but also supplement it to the curriculum that exists on Coursera. This is for one particular subsector, which is 360 filmmaking. I think that cost, the cost costs around $20. And it's a really, really good, well thought through course. And also one of the things that the solar said was, you know, right now we are looking at no code technology. Eh? So when you go to, when you go to, uh, when you go to like SwiftXR and different platforms, you can be able to rapidly build and publish immersive content without going through the whole learning curve. It's really been reduced. So there's a lot of platforms. For instance, if you're into augmented reality, you can check out Zappa Works. You know, Zapworks is a studio that allows you to build and publish AR and scale it across mobile, across WebXR. It doesn't matter. So there's there's solutions. Maybe what we can also do, Tabiola, what I'm trying to do is I've been busy trying to get, I have an AIXR funding sheet that has a lot of information about uh, funding opportunities and contacts to those institutions offering funding. So I wanted to share it on chat, but for some reason I can't share that document. Allow me to forward it to you after uh, after this um, engagement, and then you can be able to forward it to the uh, to the rest of the participants. I think it's a really good uh, platform for you to be able to just tap into the different sort of funding that exist. Uh, look at Unity for uh, there's Unity for Humanity. There is the Epic Mega Grants. These are grants that can also help you either secure project funding or just look at the requirements for the grants, but there's, there's a lot of support when it comes to funding in XR. And I, I wanna share some of those resources. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Brian. So once you send it to me, I will share with uh, the attendees. This is one of the perks of coming, you know, for live uh, sessions like this. Thank you so much, Brian. So one more question, and I would like Sabiha to answer just very briefly. What is the future of video consumption? Sure, I think depending on how far we push, you know, and build these physical technologies that are going to allow us to consume video in different ways. I think video is also like, I mean, right now, what we're doing right now is video consumption and, and allowing that from different places in the world. And I think, I mean, quite honestly, I don't, I, I don't even know how far we're going to push video consumption, whether it's going to be something that's super interactive. I think I saw something on LinkedIn where they're building these screens where you can almost 3D interface through video. I mean, I don't know, Brian, maybe you feel like you, <laughs> that's more your world, the immersive experiences. <laughs> I hear you. Uh, no, fair enough. I think the future of video, and this is a really good friend of mine who has a question, is called Mike Strano. He has this platform called My Movies Africa. The way he set up the platform is so cool. Like you can be able to either own a film or just stream it and watch. So thank you so much, Mike Strano, for also really paving the way on how you can be able to uh, revolutionize video streaming services in Africa. So I think one of the, the, the future as a... As a filmmaker, because I'm also a filmmaker, as a filmmaker, one of the things I feel like for me is um, not a barrier of entry is the fact that immersive video production is not here to, um, to replace linear video. I feel like both of them can exist. I feel like there's stories that can be shared in an immersive format and the stories that can be shared in a linear format based on the narrative itself. So I feel like also the future of this, yes, of course, including some form of immersive uh, aspect of it, but also there's one thing that I'm also scared of is AI. The other day, my team was able to render a full 360 experience, a full 360 static image using like equirectangular format using AI. 
We just typed man in desert doing, I don't know what. And it just populated this thing. And I'm like, oh my That's God. Block lab. Block yeah. lab. It's crazy, man. Yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. So I see also the future of video format being, you know, in terms of the production workflow, it's going to take shorter to produce uh, to produce content based on the fact that technology has really moved in leaps and bounds. You're looking at more immersive formats when it comes to the future of production based on, you know, now people are recording films in spatial audio format in different camera angles. So I feel like there's a lot of, in terms of entertainment and video, your platform really needs to be quite dynamic in terms of its offering because I, I'm particularly scared of AI and I'm particularly calling for the world to un stop and understand what we are building. Let's take a hiatus from AI for maybe a year or two years, just to understand. This is <laughs> a story for another day. There'll, there'll be a new thing next year. Last year was NFTs and blockchain. This year yeah, AI, exactly. next year will be something else. Absolutely. Yeah. This has been a fantastic session. So fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Sabiha, Brian, and Adeshola for gracing us with your presence and sharing all of this uh, insightful conversations with us. This has been amazing. Uh, we still have a lot of people on the call. So if you found this interesting, just like I did, please share your thank you so much, Sabiha. Thank you so much, Brian. Thank you so much, Adeshola in the chat thank box. Thank you for Leave your Yes, thank you thank so you. much. Um, I'm just going to read through, you know, announcements uh, because we're literally out of time, 12 minutes, you know, extended. So let me just tell you a little bit about uh, our project. So we have this project where we allow creatives to work in our Lagos office and our uh, Nairobi office for free. So if you're a creative and you're looking for free work desks, and you want to host your events for free in IHOP Nairobi and uh, CC Hub Lagos, please come over, register right now. Um, Naomi on the chat. Naomi's in the chat box and then she's going to send the link to you. I would also send the link to you. It's called the Stawi Spaces, Spaces and we allow creatives in Nairobi and creatives in Lagos to work from our spaces for free. Uh, we also have a newsletter, you know, so uh, please subscribe to our newsletter so that you can, you know, get all of, okay, so all the lists is there, yeah, the links are there. So sign up for our newsletter so that you can get updates from us, you know, you can get uh, to know what uh, event is coming up. We also share a lot of goodies. I mean, someone won uh, amazing guest cards, you know, so, uh, sorry, gift cards, you know, and who knows what you might read next. <laughs> so please in our newsletter, subscribe and join our community. Okay, we have had uh, an amazing time here. I just want to say again, thank you so much. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you for our audience who came here. And I am so happy that you came because I've learned a lot and I know you've learned a lot. And also to my dope and amazing colleagues who are here supporting me in one way or the other. Thank you so much. I mean, everybody needs to have a blessing, a labake, a naomi, a wanjiku, a messy joy, and an amazing boss like a drama. So thank you so much, everyone. And bye-bye. I don't want to take any more of your time. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Have bye, guys. Thank you. That yeah, was cool. Bye. Yeah, so if you want to rewatch the live stream, please uh, go on uh, YouTube and the link is there. Now, please just share the um, live stream so that people can rewatch the, you know, the conversation, uh, revisit the conversation and watch the session all over again. Okay. Uh, Tabilola, I've just sent you the email with the XR funding fact sheet. I've already sent it. So please share it with the participants. Let them start applying for this stuff. Okay, thank you so much, Brian. I will do Ooh. so. So All right. we have your yeah, email yeah. addresses. Bye, guys. Yeah. I will send Bye. Lovely to meet Bye. you both. Bye. Yeah. Bye, 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 Bye,